This podcast is made possible through donations from listeners like you and our partners at Tallman Equipment, where they pride themselves on equipping their customers with the tools they need to get the job done right. They are dedicated to set the standard for quality, convenience, and reliability. At Tallman, your opinion is important to them. Rate and review any product or tool you've used on their new website at tallmanequipment.com. Line 1 1 Clothing Company. Making apparel for our first responders with a positive message to patriots that you can be proud of. The proceeds of the cost goes to helping our foundation ignite the fire for father engagement. Give them a follow at Line 1 1 Clothing on Instagram. And last but not least, Monzingo Knives. Each knife is created with craftsmanship that only a tradesman could provide. Find them on Instagram at Monzingo Knives and get your American-made Monzingo knife today. Welcome to the Show Up Dad podcast. This has been created for hardworking fathers. At the Show Up Dad, we recognize that fathers providing for their children is certainly important. But when men truly understand their unique role and gain the knowledge and skills to be great fathers, they can transform and impact future generations. I'd like to give a warm welcome to Anthony Sabio. Tony has decades of experience in the security and intelligence industry from a long and distinguished career in the U.S. Navy, the Secret Service, and the CIA. Tony served under George Bush as a tactical canine handler with the emergency response team in the Special Operations Division for President Protection Detail. He later became the deputy chief for the Counterintelligence Center and has deployed well over 1,500 days to numerous countries across the world. He currently serves as the chief security officer for Colorado Security Agency, which provides security for Fortune 500 agencies and high-value dignitaries. Welcome to the show, brother. Hey, David. How you doing? That's a wonderful intro right there. Thank you so much for that. <laughs> hey man it's it's your your story brother i mean it, yeah. i'm just so honored to have you on here dude you your resume is i mean stellar stellar um thank you thank you i, I appreciate that absolutely bro shoot i remember what's it been like over 20 years since i last seen you yeah i had a you know a lot of hair back then <laughs> not so much now <laughs> i still have a big old freaking bush on my head dude you know <laughs> yeah i can see that i can see that right away from those pictures man <laughs> some people are blessed all right <laughs> <laughs> well anthony bro i just want to have you open up with our audience by you telling us a little bit about your about your childhood as you remember it if you don't mind bro yeah not a problem so you know i grew up in uh, san diego it's not a good area a little town or a little city called national city mm -hmm. uh pretty hard I mean, my parents uh, divorced when I was young at five. My dad was uh, in the Navy. Uh, my mom is a Latina from Puerto Rico. Um, it, it, was, it wasn't the, the picture perfect. I mean, you look at my resume, you're like, wow, this, uh, you know, should have came from a, from a great upbringing. Uh, it's pretty hard. And, and I really gravitated towards a lot of mentors through my time. You know, I even tell guys that I served in the military, staff sergeants, you know, gunnies, uh, one in particular, gunner sergeant David French, you know, I told him he's my mentor uh, along the way. So, you know, I always strive to try to uh, learn from other people, not just from my, my father, myself, uh, from my parents, but, uh, you know, other people growing up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, you said that you grew up in National City and it was pretty rough. Can you uh, elaborate on that, Anthony? Was it just yeah. like the street life or what do you mean by that like no so uh in national city it's it's high in the games uh and you had to figure out a side you're going to be on even if you weren't part you had to have some sort of allegiance to, to something out there and you know back then that's all we knew that's all that's uh that's what i grew up in uh what really turned for me was when uh it was my 16th birthday uh, I was coming over to my girlfriend's house uh, late at night, 12 midnight, um, and I, I was walking down the street, car rolls up to me, you know, asked me what I claim and uh, pulled the shotgun out. Uh, right there, you know, my life went right in front of my eyes. What was I going to do? Um, you know, I played it cool, you know, not knowing anything and, and not uh, uh, trying to, to get shot myself. 
uh, luckily, by the grace of God, you know, they, they rolled on. Um, and from there, I knew that I just had to make a difference. I had to make a change. And, and that had me embark on, on trying to uh, move on and see things uh, that's bigger, bigger than myself. Man, that's, that's crazy that that happened to you. I mean, I'm sure tons of our listeners, you know, have had similar incidents where, you know, there was a life-changing event that caused us to, to want to do better, you know? Definitely, definitely. I, I mean, I see it every day out there. Um, and that, that's one of the things, you know, listen to your podcast. There's kids out there that could do amazing things if they just have the right mentorship, they have the right guidance, they have the right leadership, the, the, the right father figure. Uh, and, and I always said, you know, being a father isn't about it. You know, having to give birth to a certain person, a certain child, myself. Uh, one of my kids is a uh, is adopted. He was in the system since he was seven years old. Father, biological father, uh, is in jail for uh, multiple criminal activities that he did uh, to his uh, his wife and also out in the streets and to his kids. Um, and so when I took him on, it took a long time, but I showed to him personally uh, what it is to, to, to have somebody, have a father. And, and, and I'm happy to say that, you know, his life turned from where statistically, you know, he would be in jail. He'll be doing the same thing that uh, all he, he knew. Mm -hmm. uh, now, very successful. He's 19. He's going to school. He's, uh, uh, you know, working hard. Uh, he's, he's really building his life up. And I'm, I'm so proud of him. Mm -hmm. and all my kids also it's really cool that you said that because uh one of the things that i've heard is what walks in fathers runs in sons so yes. it's absolutely true when you say that that kid could have went down the same route as his father you know but that having good mentors like your own father and and mentors you know whether it be staff sergeants or whatever in the military you know having those those mentors are so important especially being a male you know what I mean? You got to have that positive male influence in your life, you know? Oh, definitely. I mean, I mean, we see it right now, you know, how many kids are, are out there uh, this last summer um, or some prior, all the protests and everything going on, mm -hmm. uh, you know, kids being out there looting, uh, being disrespectful. You know, the, when I look at it, you know, what's, what's the thing that's missing there? It's guidance. It's, it's love. Mm. And that, that comes from fathers, you know, when, uh, you know, mothers are fantastic and nurturers, they, they, they bring you up, they take care of you when you fall down, you know, they patch you up, you know, but the father, he guides, he, he protects, he gives them knowledge, he shows you what's right and what's wrong. Uh, and that, that's what we're missing. And, you know, for me, do my little part, um, mm -hmm. helping out as a, as a foster uh, you know, parent, and then also adopting you know, that's my little part. Like I'd always told myself, if I could impact one life and, and steer that person, steer that child towards uh, the way I was steered, you know, by the grace of God and also, you know, by good mentors and my good father in my life, you know, why not? You know, it just means so much more. So it's almost like you want to just pay it forward, you know, the, just the... And that's operating from that sense of gratitude, right? Because you're yes. so, you know, you're just so ecstatic about how your life and everything has transpired. You know what I mean? I'm sure there's ups and downs and stuff like that, but you're thankful that you had mentors and now you're able to pay that forward. And that, that's an amazing thing. It really is, Tony. Yes. Yes. Uh, and, and you know, you know what, um, one of the things that I've, I've always uh, struggled with personally was my own personal demons growing up, you know, broken home and, and not knowing your place and not having father 24 seven, you know, you, you grow up trying to, to prove to yourself, to strive. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of kids out there right now, you know, they're not bad kids, they're misguided. They're trying to prove themselves that they're mm -hmm. worthy. They're trying to show everyone, hey, I'm here, I'm screaming out here, come see me. It's just they're guided towards the wrong things. Mm -hmm. You know, for me, that one incident, when I was 16, changed my life because I was, I could have went down that route. I could have done all those things that all my friends at the time were doing. At that time, I decided it's like, I need to change my environment. 
I need to change. I need to do something. I don't know what I'm doing, but I'm going to do it. And by the grace of God, he put great people in my life along the way that believed in me and, and, and showed me how to be a man. And now when I'm sitting back over here, I actually look and read that intro. And like I said, you know, you make me sound so amazing. But when I go back, I always tell people, if I go back in time and I tell the 16 year old Tony back then, this is where you're going to be at. Uh, you're going to serve, you know, under, you know, a president uh, directly. You're going to uh, serve in the CIA as a, you know, Caltech officer. You're going to be a chief security officer protecting people's lives you know that old tony right there was saying first off what's the secret service what's the cia you know right and nowhere right. would you think that no that's that would never happen and that's the thing that fathers do for kids they open their eyes up to the possibilities of what you can be you know and we're just talking fathers with sons we're talking fathers with daughters Mm -hmm. What can they be? How great can you be? And inspire them to be more than what they what they even dream of. And like I said, grace of God, I had people along my route that believed in me. And, and because I respected them and I want to show them uh, respect and show them that uh, uh, and thank them for believing in me, I worked hard to mm -hmm. not dis disappoint them. It, 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 it's amazing. Uh, just that little mentorship along the way you're, in your life, mm -hmm. how to how to do amazing things. Now, Tony, you, you talk a lot about your father and mentors, brother. Um, what are some of your earliest childhood memories that you have of your father, if you don't mind? My father is fantastic. You know, um, mm -hmm. my mom passed away about five years ago, and my mom's in, uh, I'm sorry uh, to hear that. Latina. It's it's. Thank you so much for that. Um, and, but she's a Latina, and Latina is hot and cold. My dad is uh, is Filipino, so you know two ethnic uh, races. Mm -hmm. And uh, I didn't understand the divorce when I was young, and mm -hmm. I didn't. I always ask questions why, especially my brother. It was um, me and my brother, who was older. Mm -hmm. You know, he held some bitterness there. I kind of took a step back and kind of just let everything play out. And, took second filter to a lot of things but i always inside always asked why why is my dad not here why was he not present as much as as i wanted him to uh but down the road later on i started seeing the little things that he was doing and i actually saw the love he had for my mom it just wasn't working out um i hold no regrets towards that you know being a father married also you know you mm -hmm. kind of understand that situation but I've never, you know, thinking back in the moments of, of, of being with him, of, of taking this little tidbits. He doesn't say a lot to you, mm -hmm. you know, but when he does say it to you, it, it's, it's, it's very profound and very respectful. He puts it in, in a way to where you're going to make your decision uh, and he's going to support you no matter what. And I, I didn't pick up on things like that. Uh, it wasn't until later on in my life with me being a uh, a father myself, mm -hmm. kind of reflecting back on things I went through and kind of seeing how much love he has. I will tell you this, our relationship now is a hundred times stronger than before, only because I truly see the love he had for, for me, my mm -hmm. brother, and the love he had for my mom. Uh, it just wasn't the best situation. And he chose to just take a step back from the, the marriage only because it wasn't the healthiest uh, situation to be in. And, and I think he did that sacrifice um, to, to make things better for us in the long run. Hmm. It's uh, interesting to see that um, as a child, you don't hold that grudge because a lot of children, they have the tendency to, to think of it as what did I do? Right. It's about, especially like in divorce, you know, it's a, uh, the way a child's mind works is, is very, um, they, they, they tend to take it on to themselves. So when yes. something happens, they tend to automatically go to that blaming of themselves where they think, Oh man, I must have not been good enough. You know, daddy's leaving because I did something, you know, and it's, it's good to see that you didn't take that victim mentality. You know, yeah, that's what I it mean, is. 
you know? It is. It is. It, it takes a victim mentality. You know, uh, I saw it with my, you know, with my adopted son. You know, mm-hmm. I saw that, that mentality of how, you know, he had a wall up of this hardness, but deep down it was, I wasn't good enough. Mm-hmm. And, you know, seeing that with, with you know, understanding this, the psychology of that and the kids, you know, it, it's, yeah, I didn't do that. You know, I played a victim, do whatever. You know, I just wanted more from my, mm-hmm. from what I was having in my life. You know, and, and those things uh, help guide me. It's it's amazing being on the other end and seen as a father in the psychological aspect of it. it, it it's once you're on the other side and start seeing it and really dive in deep. It, it tends to make it easier to communicate with kids because you kind of can see it from there and also as long as you're not you're kind of humble and say hey listen i went through the same stuff too Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. now you anthony um you're you're not you're not married correct right now so no okay so how did your father's interaction with your mother how did that affect you in, in in choosing a woman for one and even in your husbandry skills, you know what I mean? Seeing that you, yeah. you, you grew up in a, in, a, in a broken home, you know what I mean? Does, did that have any yeah. kind of effect on you or any yeah. decision yeah. or anything like that? Uh, a that thousand goes? percent. No, a thousand percent. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, and, and uh, going through a lot of personal growth through therapy and prayer and, and talking with different people, mm-hmm. you know, I, I learned a lot about myself and pitfalls that I was doing, you know, coupled with uh, of things is, you know, as a child, the way you learn love is through your parents. Mm-hmm. That's the only way, you know, I always tell people a baby that comes into life is a blank canvas. Mm-hmm. The sins of that soon to be adult, the vices, the anything, racism, anything, is put into that person's, that baby's head. Mm-hmm. They're not born with that. They're born as a perfect masterpiece. And God does not make mistakes. Everyone's a masterpiece. Mm-hmm. It's us as people that make the mistakes. And so when I look at that, you know, um, when, I, when I look at my relationship, mm-hmm. you know, I, I had to take a, a deep dive into it and, and with a lot of prayer and after my salvation, in 2017, I, I really was able to come to terms with a lot of things that I was doing as a father and also as a husband and understood that the things that I was doing in a relationship wasn't because I wanted to. It was because that's the only thing I knew. It's the only thing I learned. I learned that a relationship was hot and cold. There had to be, you know, ups and downs like big ups from you know fighting to these downs and this full-on hugging loving and everything mm-hmm. um but i also found out you know the hard way that that's not a healthy relationship you know there shouldn't be these big ups and downs there shouldn't be these big blow ups and you know communication is the key mm-hmm. um and and that is something that I had to retrain myself. And that was a lot of pitfalls that I did, mm-hmm. you know, not talking, closing up, kind of shunning everything away, you know, not communicating was a hugest thing that I never did with my marriage. Mm-hmm. And that's a big step. You probably go to a lot of guys out there and a lot of females and, 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 and talk to a lot of people. Communication is probably the number one thing, you know, so Mm-hmm. Um, it, for all the guys out there, I'll tell you this, you want to work on that relationship, the five love language book. Yep. That's the key. I read it five times and you know what? I'm not embarrassed to say it. Help me out a lot. Learn yeah. how to communicate, opening up your feelings, you know, to a point where, you know, sometimes I open up too much about how I feel. Mm-hmm. And, and that's the cool thing too, Tony, is that once you start doing that self-growth and, you know, that self-reflection, it doesn't make you weaker as a man. Cause obviously you're not a weak dude. <laughs> you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. I, I mean, I remember you back in the day, you're, you're a loke bro. And, uh, 
you know, and that, that means a lot coming from me. Cause I was pretty loked out too. You know yeah. what I mean? <laughs> you oh, know? We all were back then. Man. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you know, just to see that you're able to be vulnerable and just open up about that book and just, you know, it takes a, a real man to be able to say, Hey man, I need help. You know what I mean? And yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to dive into these books. I'm going to, I'm going to do that self-assessment. I'm going to, I'm going to make those positive changes, not just for me, but for my future, because our children are our legacy. Yeah. Yeah, it definitely is. And, you know, you know, it's funny, you know, we grew up, you know, going to military and, 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 you know, for myself moving into, and even yourself and your line of work that you do Mm -hmm. um, in your career, you know, having feelings wasn't something that you could really push out. It was, you know, you're shut upon, you know, what mommy and daddy didn't hug you enough. That's what you got. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know what I found going through all my time overseas and then dealing with everything I've dealt with, um, it's easier to to face a barrel of a gun and to turn around and look internally at you, at yourself and say, Hey, I need help. I can't do this alone. Mm -hmm. I need someone that's harder. Um, you know, I've lost a lot of friends from PTSD, uh, that all of a sudden it just ended in beautiful lives and everything. And it's that internal reflection that comes mm-hmm. out and, and it's coming to peace with themselves. It's coming and saying, Hey, you know, yeah, I, I've, I've done these amazing things. I'm probably the cream of the crop out there and the biggest, toughest guy next to Rambo, you know, but inside I'm, I'm a small, scared little kid that's broken. I need help. I need guidance. I, I didn't have that father figure. I didn't have those mentors. And I don't know how to cope with this stuff. And, and we lose a lot of people because of that. It's, just, it's one of the hardest things. Uh, but I think, you know, as a society, especially in, in the military, in the tactical field, more guys are coming to terms with that and, and actually reach out and gain that help. Mm-hmm. No, it, you're absolutely right, brother. I mean, there's so many lives that have been lost just because of men not being able to cope, deal, or communicate what they're feeling. Um, Definitely. I, I know for even for myself, you know, a lot of times, just like you, I would shun my wife, you know, and my children, mm-hmm. you know, they say that the curse of fatherhood is distance, right? Yep. And yep. when you have that distance, that distant dad syndrome, you know what I mean? It's usually because the father is internalizing a lot of things and he doesn't know how to deal with those, those emotions because a, we've been taught at a young age, if you've ever played sports to rub some dirt on it and, and exactly. B, it requires trust, right? Because yeah. let's look at trust, dude. It can be very dangerous because trust depends on that vulnerability, right? So yeah. when we're not being vulnerable, right? It's because there's a, a risk that is carried with that, you know? So when we cannot communicate what we're feeling, when we're afraid to tell our buddies, hey, man, I'm having an issue, it's always because of a, a trust issue there. there. We don't feel like we can tell that person that we feel that they may look at us in a different light. And it goes back to even what you said earlier about approval and acceptance, right? Exactly. We're exactly. afraid it, they're not going to accept us. For it, 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 it all it all ties into to our childhood. That's one thing I learned, you know, mm-hmm. it, it, everything goes back to the essence of when you're that masterpiece and things were put on that white canvas. Mm-hmm. That was put there. You just got to unlearn that. It's not bad. I mean, listen, you and I both, I don't know about you, but I didn't get a manual when I became a father. It didn't come with a baby. Nope. I mean, it's hard. It's <laughs> hard. Man. You're struggling. You're yep. struggling with things that you learn, things that you see. And now you have a child and now you're dealing with them and you're like, oh, what's going on here? So yeah, it, it's, it's hard. And, and self-reflection talking with other fathers, getting good mentors, uh, those are critical. I mean, right now we're probably like the worst of my personal thing, the worst we could be with the, the state of families. Mm-hmm. I mean, we have kids out there disrespecting, uh, you know, and what happened? It's, it comes down to the father figures, comes down to those uh, people stepping up, you mm-hmm. know, people looking internally and saying, hey, I need to take care of these demons so I can be a better person, I can be a better father. You know, it, yeah, it's hard. And like I said, podcasts like yours, you know, church groups, different things like that. Most amazing things that could, that could happen for our society. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I mean, even, I mean, just 
look at your father. You know what I mean? Let's mm-hmm. go back and let's go back to your dad. Yeah. You know, obviously he had such a big impact on you that, you know, you can contribute that in your success of working in the security and intelligence industry. You know what I mean? Yeah. How, how big was that role that he played that you chose that career? You know what I mean? Huge. I mean, my dad, uh, obviously, you know, he was a mate. Yeah. Um, and he served. He served uh, wonderfully. Retired. Mm-hmm. He he showed me his honor commitment. He showed me a different way. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, that's where I decided to go into the military mm-hmm. was because of him, uh, because of his guidance, because I wanted to be more like him. Mm-hmm. Um, and then during the time, it was part of, I mean, a huge part of me is my dad. You know, when, when uh, humility is one thing that I carry. I, I don't think when, when you read that stuff, I don't think of myself in that way, in that, in that, in that sense. I'm just another person out there. Uh, just, just helping out, serving. Mm-hmm. You know, he's shown me that. I mean, he's done countless deployments, and he served his country. He's, uh, you know, Filipino descent. He did everything, uh, sacrificed his own education. He was going to go to school to be an engineer, and and uh, decided to join the military in the Philippines to help bring his family over from the Philippines. I mean, that's mm-hmm. a huge sacrifice that he did for, him, for his family. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, and then staying in the military and, and sacrificing his time uh, while we're, you know, reaping the benefits. He, he taught me that. He taught me that selflessness. He taught me that sacrifice. He taught me to give, give more of myself. And then seeing the dynamic between him and my mom after their own divorce and how much he still loved her and took care of her when he didn't have to. I mean, that showed me selfishness. Mm-hmm. Uh, so those attributes for the base of who i am now uh and today so uh, you know it's it, he is a big part of mm-hmm. why i moved into the government why i moved into security and intelligence uh he's a, a great impact on me mm-hmm. it, it's pretty interesting to see because you know i've had uh past guests on here that were warriors as well just like yourself you know mm-hmm. i've had andy marr he was a green beret i had um uh, one of Echelon Front's uh, instructors, uh, Jason Gardner, who is a a SEAL. You know, you probably ran into yeah. him a few times. Um, Master Chief, retired sniper. Mm-hmm. And uh, they all have the same deal, selflessness. You know, and that's that's what a true warrior is. And as a father, you know, we're called to be a protector, right? And yeah. having that same selflessness that you just talked about, you know what I mean? And something that was modeled early to you by your father yes you know i i I see that transition i see see that tie right there and i think it's pretty awesome you know yeah yeah i mean you you are you're literally part of what your your parents are that's who Mm -hmm. you are you know you you grow up uh to be your parents and and, you know that that's why i take with my kids you Mm -hmm. know i I try to bring joy happiness and everything to them you know even though uh I sacrifice a lot of my time to be mm-hmm. away from them. You know, uh, I still try to do that every day. Mm-hmm. And it's interesting that you said that because, you know what I mean, that they they mirror us, right? Um, mm-hmm. There's a flip side to that too. I mean, not only is there a positive that they're mirroring, there's a negative yeah, to yes. that as well. So, you know, they have these mirror neurons in their head where they're going to they're gonna see that. And that's, I take that back to even fatherhood where, Sometimes if you're self-aware, you'll catch yourself doing things to your children that you didn't like your father doing to you. And you're like, where the hell, why, why am I doing that? You know, why am I yelling? Why am I acting like that? Why am I, you know, losing my temper like that? And it's like, oh man, I saw that before. And it's because we tend to go back to what we know. Yes. That's uh, a thousand percent. I agree with that. So my father himself, I mean, he's, Mm -hmm. you know, he's a very reserved person. Um, but the emotional part of giving the emotions out of the hugs and, and different things wasn't really for them. I mean, it's a, I guess it's a generational thing. Mm-hmm. And so I caught myself early in the stages of, of my career as, you know, going through my career and then into fatherhood, bearing the same stuff, you know, um, not really hugging my son, 
not giving those little hugs because I just thought that that's not what we do. Mm-hmm. And that's because I didn't have that because my dad was reserved because of that time frame of where he grew up, um, but not seeing that kind of stuff. So I, I had to retrain myself. Um, and at times in the very beginning, it was kind of, I felt kind of awkward, you know, it's like, okay, my son's a teenager and I'm hugging him and telling him I love you and giving him hugs. Like, I don't know, my daughters, I hug him all the time. It's just different, but for, you know, for a father to a son, it was just that I shouldn't be doing this. You know, he doesn't need this kind of stuff, but in reality he does, you know, and, and my son, uh, and, you know, my biological son, William, you know, now he's a sergeant in the Marine Corps. It's, it's amazing, you know, wow. and, and yeah, it's it just, I'm so proud of him. So proud of all my kids, but you know, it took me a while to, to break that down to really, I had to really catch myself and say, okay, hold on. I need to hug my son, you know? Um, but it was what I, I learned. I learned that as, as a kid. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, uh, me too as well. I mean, you know, I didn't get that growing up. Um, but man, it makes such a big difference, especially for my, my baby, man. I could tell when something's bothering him and he's, he's all boy, you know, I mean, this yeah. kid, he lifts weights. He, he sees daddy tells mama that he wants to have abs like dad. And you know what I mean? He's just all boy, yeah. you know, and you could kind of see the protector in the kids, the ones that have that. I, I don't know if it's a gene or whatever, but it's in them. You know what I mean? Like my, my, yeah. my other boy, the redhead, the middle one, Lucas, um, he, you know, he's, he stands up for whatever, you know what I mean? But he's more lackadaisical. He's more, um, he wants to know details. Whereas yeah. baby, if you even look at his sister or his older brother crossed, he's throwing fists, <laughs> you know what I mean? And it's just that protector instinct that he has, you know, and, those course, are the ones yeah. who sometimes go to the military or, or go into law enforcement or, or stuff like yeah. that, because it's that protector gene that's in them, you know? No, exactly. Exactly. You'll it, never go away. Yep. And it, it's, yeah. it's really cool to see that, you know, in them. And just, you start noticing that when you're being intentional, you know, when, you, when you're yeah. being aware of what's going on in your, in your kids' lives, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And, and like I said, it took me a while, you know, I was so caught up myself mm-hmm. personally into my career because it just kept going and going and going. And, you know, like the sands of time, mm-hmm. you know, I'm with your kids just pass by because you're giving so much of yourself and you're, you're, you're losing, you know, the root of what life is all about. You know, mm-hmm. what, what is this all about? It's about your kids, you know, mm-hmm. me personally, I had to take a step back. I I had to make that decision on my my own personal transition was more important. You know, at a certain point in time, you got to put it up. You got you done enough, and uh, you know, missing you know softball games, missing football games, not being there for all mm-hmm. the small stuff. You know, now you know I sit back and, and, and I cherish all the little moments. You know, all the in between the holiday times. You know, all the, the the little cooking we do, spontaneous type of things. Mm-hmm. That's what means the most, you know. And everything you do in the career, I mean, we're talking about, you know, fathers out there that are striving to provide for their kids, you know, and, and they lose the fact of that balance. You know, how much is enough, you know? Does, does money mean everything to your kids or the time that you're going to spend with them, you know? So, uh, you know, myself, I had to fix that you know i learned that also from seeing my father he was giving you know and that's what i learned to give but to give in a sense of monetary doesn't really mean anything for a small kid when all they want to do is play catch right you know and, and i knew myself i was taking extra points i thought i was like i just want to give more mm-hmm. i want to give more a bigger house than my kids i want to give them everything i didn't have mm-hmm. and at the end of the day you know, I lost me personally. I lost that balance. You know, I, all they wanted was their, was their dad to play, you know, Xbox. <laughs> yeah, right. and that was it. Yeah. Hey, Tony, why do you think that like fathers that are successful in their careers have a tendency to sacrifice the relationship with their families? Why do you think we do that? Because I, I I'm guilty of it myself. You know, but why? Yeah. Why do you think? 
man, it, it, it's hard. It's a balance there. You know, it's like a double-edged sword. You know, mm -hmm. a lot of people that are very successful in what they do, they struggle with a lot of things. And mm -hmm. Part of it is the insecurities that they have that they have to prove to other people and keep mm -hmm. proving, keep proving, you know? Uh, myself, I was insecure. You know, I, I broke a family. Um, my dad wasn't really around as much as possible. You know, I, I don't know where I fit in this place. You know, I had to keep striving, striving. Every success you gain, you want to prove to yourself that you that you can get more. And it, it's like a high. You know, mm -hmm. I've seen it right now where, where guys will still that are very successful still will not take the time for the kids. Mm -hmm. um, and one success builds off another. You know, you're successful at this point. It's like, hey, let me try to get this one. Let me try to get this one. And, and in your mentality, you're going to slow down sooner than later. But then all of a sudden, 20 years pass by. Mm -hmm. And your kids that were, you know, five and six are now driving and having drinks with you. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, what happened here, you know? Uh, and that's, that's, a, that's the worst part about it. Success builds more success. And unless you can control that, unless you just have that balance, it's going to sacrifice. Mm -hmm. And for me, I literally missed most of my kids' upbringing. Yeah, I provide them a lot of stuff, and, and, but it's gone. You mm -hmm. can't take it back. It's like I, I tell people, it's like the sands of time. Once that grain goes through that hourglass, it's not going back. It can't go back up. Mm -hmm. And I think when I had my salvation in 2017 is really when I sat back and realized what's more important in the world. You know, mm -hmm. I, I can't take, I can't get time back. Time is the most precious thing. You can't buy it. So no matter what you do, you, you're not buying time back. You're not reversing time with your kids. You have one time in that moment, in those years, you're with them. And then, then it's gone. It's a memory. And so for me, you know, I had to sit back and, and say, what is more important? And, you know, when I thought about it, you know, when I'm sitting, you know, on my deathbed, no matter all the accolades I did and, and my career and everything, I, I thought about this. Mm -hmm. When I'm sitting on that deathbed, is the CIA going to be sitting right there on that deathbed? Is the Secret Service going to be there? Is the U.S. military going to be sitting right there? on that deathbed uh, when I have my last word on this earth? Mm -hmm. Or is it going to be my family? It's going to be my kids. And that's why I made the decision. I was like, what are my priorities? Now, I'm not saying to all the dads out there, you know, just go out there and just don't have a career in anything, but you got to have that balance. Mm -hmm. You know, it's kind of like those, those uh, you know, those athletes out there where they put too much into one area and, you know, it, it affects everything else, you know. You have to have that balance. You can't go overboard. And, and that balance is what makes you, you whole. I found that through my salvation. Mm -hmm. I also found that through other mentors and also seeing other people and how they interact with their kids. And, and I learned from that. Okay, hey, maybe I, I need to be more like that. Mm -hmm. That's that self-awareness of looking at yourself. Uh, right now, I have... You know, with the company I'm with, two wonderful owners love very, very, very religious, and and they love uh, their their family. Mm -hmm. Every time I go visit with them, I see that, and I'm like, I need to be more like that. And so, that's that self awareness. So like a lot of guys out there, you know, that's career driven. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're up and coming in a career, if you're still, you know, midway in that career, and you're striving for certain things, understand that there's a sacrifice to that, you know, and, and you want to have that balance. Maybe that next promotion to gain another $10,000 a year mm -hmm. isn't worth it. If it's going to take you away from the kids and you're going to miss all these moments that you can never get back. Mm -hmm. you know, that's how I look at it. No. And I agree with you, bro. Um, you got to definitely like, you know, you talked about that balance, right? Um, it is possible to have a career and a balanced family life, but it's going to take a lot of work and it's going to take you to be intentional, you know, intentional exactly. with, your, with your time. You know, um, one of the things we always talk about at the show up that is be where your feet are. And, I, I, you know, I drive this home every single time because it's so true. If you're at home, 
be at home, turn off your damn phone. If you can, you know, um, yeah. If, you know, if you're playing Legos with your kid, you know, don't, don't start staring off into the distance, wishing you're somewhere else, you know, at the bar or whatever, or on, on the, the golf course or whatever, be there in that moment with your child, you know, be there with your wife. Exactly. Exactly. You know, you know one thing that I started doing when I like came, became more self-aware mm-hmm. and, and granted my kids were older at the time, uh, they were already set in ways. Um, they weren't very, you know, jump, they weren't jumping through the hoops to go spend more time with dad. Mm-hmm. But I used to cook dinner. And after dinner, you know, we all sit at the table. And after dinner, we did family time. We did mm-hmm. one hour. And everyone put their phones away. And we'll play board games. We'll play, we'll watch a movie. We'll do anything. So each, each child of mine will be their rotation. That they get to decide what we do for that hour, mm-hmm. you know? Um, and, and my, my kids used to be like, dad, why are we doing this? And it's funny because one day, one of my daughters brought, had her, you know, friend over mm-hmm. for dinner and her to sleep over. And so we did it. And, you know, this, I hear this from, from my daughter later on and she tells her friend, oh, you just have to deal with my dad. We have to do this thing called family time. We have to be together. Mm-hmm. And she said, really? And so, you know, we did it all. And at the end, she tells my daughter, Samantha, she's like, that's so amazing. I wish I had that. You know? And mm-hmm. a lot of kids just want that moment. So I mean, and what was I sacrificing? Mm-hmm. You know, two hours of my, of my night, turning off my phone, cooking for an hour, and then an hour doing family time. Those two hours every night, made more moments in my life mm-hmm. than anything else that's all i remember it, it's the the most fun the most laughing the, the most memories and uh, those little things like that if you have a career you can balance that out just like that it'll be amazing you, you'll see things through a different prism mm. Mm. no i i like that um one of my colleagues and a, and a dear friend, you know, what he likes to do is uh, he likes to ask questions, um, mm-hmm. you know, sim- simple questions, like hypothetical, like uh, if it's a zombie apocalypse and you're, you know, and, and stuff's going down, you know, you can only choose one gun. What gun would you choose? And what, what, what music would you be listening to while you're taking these zombies down? You know, just hypothetical questions, you know, that he shares with the family and, you know, I started doing that with my kids, you know, and around the dinner table, we call it dinner table talk. And man, it just really engages your kids and stuff like that. And it's simple. It's just a way to connect, you know? Oh, definitely. Definitely. We used to do the same thing with the, uh, you know, walking dead and everything. Mm-hmm. And each of us was tell uh, in, in the group while we're having dinner, what we bring to, to the team mm-hmm. <laughs> and why, mm-hmm. why should we be here? You know, <laughs> um, and so each one was saying that, and, you know, you get your kids and they start ribbing on the other kids because they're siblings and everything. Mm-hmm. And, you know, they're like telling my son, what well, well, you can bring your, your PSP. <laughs> That's all you do for <laughs> your video game. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so. All right. It's all those that, but the, that's the funniest thing because that, it's that jabbing back and forth and laughing and you just mm-hmm. see the connection, the bond and everything gr- growing together. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, it's the most amazing thing. And those moments in time, I, I would never, you know, take those away. I mean, mm-hmm. I, I would take away a lot of the stuff I did overseas and all my experiences. Mm-hmm. If I had to choose, I'll take those moments in time because it's amazing. Mm-hmm. Now, now talking about that, Tony, you, you said that you had your awakening, right? Now you're... Yeah understanding of what you did and your pitfalls and stuff like that um how do you cope with sacrifices you chose to to be successful like how do, you know is it is it something spiritual you know you said you're a born again believer which is awesome so am i you know um is that how you deal with some of the uh choices you have to to make for those sacrifices or like what do you do like how what can you say to our audience here well it, i'll tell you this it, it's hard it's mm-hmm. hard. You know, I strive myself. I just turned 47. 
mm-hmm. and I'm like, you know, sitting back and I miss so much of my, uh, of my kids' time and everything. I'm thinking to myself, well, I, I'm, I, still, I want to have another kid, <laughs> you know, but the reality is by the time that kid turns, you know, 60, I'm going to, or I'm sorry, you know, 20, I'll be like 67. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, you miss that. And so what, what, what can you do now, you know, is just try to be there in the moment. And that's what I sacrifice. I sacrifice my time with my kids. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the good thing about it is I taught very good morals into my kids. They understood what mm-hmm. I was doing. They, they grew up with that knowledge of selflessness, of sacrifice too. Um, you know, I, two of my four kids are in the military. Um, they, they understand. So that makes it a little bit easier mm. for me. But I, I definitely, you know, thinking back of, of, of the sacrifice, I mean, it's huge. Mm. You know, I'll never get that time back. You know, no matter how much money I made overseas, no matter how much glory, how many medals or how many plaques went on my wall, you know, I miss softball games. I miss everything. I, I miss so much. And, and seeing it through a video, it doesn't do it justice. You're not in the moment. And, uh, you know, for, for those families out there, for those fathers out there, you know, have that balance. Make, make sure, you know, those moments that you do have with your kids where you're, where you're sacrificing, being in the military, being a father, working out there in law enforcement, working in the federal government, working anywhere if that pulls you away. Understand that when you, like you said, when you're back, you're back. And when you're back, you make the most out of it because it's never going to return. You know, you go. You can always have a beer with your bro. You know, your mm-hmm. I can always have a beer, you know? Okay. You know, I can, uh, you know, I can have a beer with my bros up until, um, you know, I'm in my 80s, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know? You're right. But I, I'm, I'm not going to watch my kids play softball. I'm not going to watch them, you know, my, my daughter, uh, well, actually both daughters, wrestle. My, one of my daughters took, you know, first place in her weight class wrestling against boys. Wow. In Virginia. Yeah, she's awesome. I missed it. I didn't see her tournament. I didn't see her take that, you know, first place. I was overseas in Iraq, you know. Yeah, I was sacrificing for the country, but there it is. You know, mm-hmm. that's, that's my sad. And I can't relive it. Can't go back in time. Mm-hmm. So what I say is, if you are doing that, don't go overboard, you know. Do what you need to do. But understand that your kids and your wife, they want you more there than what you're providing to have mm. You know, money comes and goes. You know, I'm a firm believer. If you're determined to make money and, and, and you're, you're out there and you want to provide for your family, you will make the money. You will provide, mm-hmm. you know. But providing also provides you, you being a mentor, you being in there in the moment, you taking care of your family. Mm-hmm. mentally you taking care of your wife not putting all the stress on her not coming home and and saying you know where's my dinner i mean many times i i basically haven't learned how to cook to take mm-hmm. the burden off because i wanted to i wanted like hey you've done so much i want to do this now mm-hmm. and, and and those all those little things you know mean a lot you know, mm-hmm. So now after this podcast, you get a bunch of guys going to cooking schools. You know, we, <laughs> could, we could go ahead and quickly relate it to this. All right. <laughs> but yeah, it, it just that's that's what you gotta do. You know, that's if you're mm-hmm. if you're gonna, you know, be successful, be driven, and, and also be a, a successful father. Mm-hmm. Have that balance. Go learn these things. Go do it. Mm. And it's also important, I think, too, Tony, just to touch on that is to have an end game. Um, I was talking to with a, another dear friend of mine, and um, we we're talking about how a lot of linemen, you know, which is the industry and the trade that we that I'm in, you know, mm-hmm. um, tend a lot. We, we work a lot of hours, right? Um, some guys are working 96, 100 plus hours, and it's a lot of time, but they have an end game, you know. 
their yeah. end game is to make a certain amount of money so they can not have to do this work, you know, for the rest, you know, for, for into their fifties, forties, whatever, you know what I mean? Yeah. They're, they're planning on investing and stuff like that. And that's what we like to see, because if you don't have an end game, then you're always left with it. Maybe next year, maybe next year, maybe next year. And when we do that, it tends to drain the hope. You know, I know for like my wife, I kept on telling mm-hmm. her, okay, well, next year I'll come home or, or the following year I'll yeah. come home or, you know, I'll, I'll get a job closer to home next year or whatever, you know what I mean? Or exactly. maybe we'll move and there's always next, next, next. And that just totally demoralized her. Oh, you know? it definitely does. You know, I, in, in my career, you know, we had a lot of contractors and, mm-hmm. uh, and a lot of the contractors came from the military. And some of them, you know, going into their 60s is still deployed overseas. Wow. It's like the player's hand game. You know, part of it as males is, you know, we keep striving for more. Mm. You know, we want to give more to our kids, want to give more to our family. But how much is enough? Mm-hmm. How big of a house do you need, honestly? Mm-hmm. You know, how many cars do you need? Do you really need a Mercedes or are you good with a Honda? <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. and, and that's the problem. Those material things the striving material things is what drives a lot of men in their careers to put things off. Oh, one more year. Oh, one more deployment. Okay. Well, that's great. But what if that's your last? Mm -hmm. And then you're going to sit there with regret, you know, Mm -hmm. why, why did I do this? What does it all mean? And that's where, you know, for me, I sat back and I was like, you know, when, when I transitioned out of the agency Mm -hmm. into the civilian sector, you know, I made this decision. I had, I wanted to tell my kids, I, I did enough overseas. I'm ready. Mm-hmm. I'm ready to go. A lot of people in the government, they'll go as a staffer. Mm-hmm. And then when they retire, they'll come back the very next day as a contractor doing the same job. And they're working, mm-hmm. doing the same thing into their 60s, 70s, 80s. And I look at it, you know, when I was ready to transition, I saw people like that, very successful, did fantastic things for the government. But I looked at it like this. When is it enough? Mm-hmm. When have you done enough? When, when is it over? Where mm-hmm. do you start your next chapter? You know, and that's the hardest thing for a lot of people in careers. They don't know when, you know, they keep striving. So they, they yeah. keep building that chapter. When does this chapter end? When does the next chapter begin? And I always tell people, you know, it was one of the scariest things, moving in from, from government and, and, and now going into the civilian sector, you know, mm-hmm. um, and trying to balance everything out, not having that right away, you know, security of a government paycheck. Mm-hmm. Um, and then also leaving what was, I felt the essence of who I was. Mm-hmm. you know everything was built around that mm-hmm. um you know for a certain point in time i lost my identity mm-hmm. like, i sat back and i was like what am i doing like who am i now uh but i i me personally you know it was it was the best decision of my life mm-hmm. i am 10 times more happier now i am able to give more spend time more with my kids mm-hmm. i have more freedom more more everything you know, yeah, I'm not carrying mm-hmm. top secret clearance anymore, you know, mm-hmm. right? but it doesn't mean anything to me. I, I don't, I don't want that life. And I, I had made that decision myself. And a lot of people, a lot of your listeners, if you're looking, if you're sitting back and thinking, okay, when is enough, you know, mm-hmm. sit back and take an internal look, reflect inside and say, okay, how much more do you need? And you got to have, you got to truly take stock into that. Mm-hmm. And it's, if it's getting a bigger house and you're striving for material things. Mm-hmm. And if you're a spiritual person, you know, God doesn't want you to strive for material things. God wants you to take a step back and look at the beauty of this world, because guess what? Time, like I said, you know, as time goes by and all of a sudden, mm-hmm. you know, you miss all the beauty of the world because you're too busy striving for more things. Mm. 
and time is so short too, Anthony. I mean, it's crazy. Um, you know, like my younger brother, you know, one of the last things he said before he passed away was all I got is 20 more years. He's like, and then I'll retire. Yeah. And he never yeah. came home, you know? So life yeah. is, is, is really, really short. Like you're saying, you know, um, one of the things I wanted to ask you, Tony, you kept talking about your career and stuff like that. Um, obviously you seem the worst and the best in people. How do you think the father role influences people in both categories as far as that goes? I think it's huge. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the essence of a father, in, in my humble opinion, is to guide, to mentor, to lead. A father's a leader. You know, the absence of having a leader leads you into not having guidance in the mm -hmm. it, it, it leads into you doing things that you shouldn't be doing. Mm -hmm. Be a good, solid leader, a good, solid father, puts you in the right direction, gives you the right path, provides you the right tools. I think it's the most essential thing. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, people I've seen, you know, through my time, I've seen good people. And I've seen bad people. I've seen the worst. I've seen the best. I've seen good leadership. I've seen bad leadership. You know, a lot of it is having that father presence, you know, when you really dive into it. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and right now, like, you know, go back to where we're at in society. A lot of these kids out there, you know, they're bad because they had no influence. Mm -hmm. They had no father figures. They had nothing to build a foundation on you know my father I, like i said gave me the foundation of certain morals of sacrifice selflessness that's what he gave me as as something to build upon mm -hmm. you can't build a house on poor foundation it's just gonna fall apart mm -hmm. so once you get that foundation you're good to go you know one of the biggest things for me in, in, in my spiritual journey is understanding that the biggest father I have is sitting in the stars right there looking after me and loving me every single day, you know, and listening to his guidance and having that internal talk with him helped me with a lot of my decisions that I made. And, and so, yeah, I think it's the most pivotal thing that you can have out there. Mothers are fantastic. Mothers are nurturers. Mothers will banish the kids up. Mothers will, you know, feed and, 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 and do those certain things. And the fathers, they guide. They, they build that base for them, those morals, mm -hmm. um, the right for the wrong. No, you're absolutely right, Anthony. Um, as fathers, our role is so pivotal, um, even down to just the, the lack of a father in certain areas to where kids are, are looking for acceptance, you know, to where young men are growing up in these worn torn countries that you've been to. And, yeah. uh, you know what I mean? They, they don't have any kind of guidance. So sometimes from what I've seen, they fall into these, these, um, not gangs, but like units, I guess it'd be like military units to where they're trying to yeah. prove themselves or trying to find that connection. Cause believe it or not, dude, everybody's always trying to fit in that thing. We talked about that, about acceptance earlier in this podcast, you know, everybody wants to be accepted. And a of lot course. of times these young boys are pulled off into these, these organizations to where they feel accepted. And sometimes those organizations are some of the, the, the people that you dealt with, you know, yeah, exactly. You, you know, in the CIA and stuff like that, you know what I mean? And you know, how, what have you seen on that? You know what I mean? Cause there's, there's certain places in the world that seem to struggle with more terrorism. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Do you feel that it's because of the, the father not being there, the father presence and stuff like that? Do you think that that has an a, astounding effect on that as well? Or it's a thousand percent. Okay. You know, like you, like you said, you know, everyone wants acceptance. A kid wants to be accepted somewhere. And that's why gangs are so prevalent. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. the difference, what's the difference between a gang that's harassing the community mm -hmm. and pushing their agenda on other people and a terrorist group like Al Qaeda mm -hmm. doing the same thing, but just on a bigger scale. Yeah. The essence of what they're doing is still the same. And so how do you recruit these people? How do you recruit these kids to come in to believe in this way of thinking? 
Mm-hmm. We find the ones that are lost, they're seeking out guidance from somewhere. And the essence of no guidance, they're going to try to find some guidance. Mm. Whether it's positive or negative, they're going to find something. And so all that person does, all that group does is put a little bit of love into them, builds them up, their, their self-esteem, and then redirects all that anger towards where they believe they want them to go to and to hate. Mm. That's all it is. I've seen it in, in, in Pakistan. I've served years in Pakistan, you mm-hmm. know, and I saw a study. They, uh, the State Department did a study out to the age group between 18 to 34, right? Mm-hmm. And they did various questions. One of the questions was, who would you rather have as the president of Pakistan? And 90% of the respondents said, Hassan Bilal. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I was amazed on this. I was like, so this is the age group, 18 to 34. This is the time frame of, you know, molding and everything. They're just coming out and now they're, you know, be absorbed in certain things. And you see it there. And why is a majority of that, those young men are believing that? It's because they were taken in because they didn't have anything. Mm-hmm. They didn't have the guidance. They didn't have the father figure. They didn't have the mentorship. They didn't have anything. And someone gave him something. Mm. Someone empowered him. Someone made him, you know, feel better about themselves, and then redirect all that negative energy towards the purpose of what they want or new stuff. Mm-hmm. You know, that's the saddest thing. I say. Most most kids that go into terrorism, you know, they didn't choose that. Mm-hmm. You know, they were ter- they're abused, they're used, and they're pushed in that direction. You know, it, it, some of the saddest things I see is these young kids that are sacrificing their lives for, you know, this ideology of hate. When in essence, the same people that are leading will not put that suicide bomb on themselves and go do that job. No, they won't. No, who will use those kids. No, who will manipulate those kids. They go do that. And that's because those kids did not have the guidance, didn't have the good structure, didn't have the fathers present to be, be able to tell them, like, no, that's wrong. Don't do that. And, and that, that's what you see, you know, and how do we break that? You know, it's the hardest thing. Mm-hmm. You have to break it through the foundation of, of families. Yes. You know, and that's not just overseas and terrorism that the typical terrorism everyone sees, but it's also over here with yes. the gangs, with the cartels, everything. It's all the same. Mm-hmm. And even with our cancel culture, I mean, we're seeing that in our schools. I mean, one of the quickest ways to to erate a, a you know a uh, a population like ours is to start turning the kids against their parents and everything that they're brought up to believe. You know, um, exactly. It, it, it's crazy and it, it's astounding. I had a conversation today with a good friend of mine that we're talking about how some of the stuff they're showing on TV is, you know acceptance everybody's talking about acceptance 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 okay i get it you know kids need to feel accepted okay and that acceptance starts at home because that's really what it is is approval right but when we're giving that 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 good approval you know saying hey son i love you or telling your daughter man you're so precious to me you're more than anything you know what i mean when we start giving them that they're not going to go seek those gangs out there or those terrorist groups or or whatever that's negative out there you know what i mean they're not going to go accept that i mean little girls today are growing up faster than they've ever done i mean and why because they're watching these things that tell them hey you're not good enough you need to get fake boobs your nose is wrong. You should be thinner. I mean, gosh, if exactly. you really think about it, that's sick. No, it is sick. It is sick. And, and we, we, you know, we built a society now mm-hmm. that is striving to, to be better, to, to live a life. I mean, yes. Do I have, you know, Instagram and Facebook and everything? Yeah, I do. Uh, but some of the things you see in there, you know, mm-hmm. you see, the good of what people want to put out there. You don't see the backstory. You don't see all the negative. You know, if, if somebody really put the real life out there, it'll be like, wow, your life is just like mine. There's nothing special over here. And then you see the, for young men growing up, right? They, they have to have so much money, they have to have so much of this to be able to get married. And it just, 
it just compounds on top of each other. And now you have, you know, you know, guys out there that are striving for things, you know, because that's, that's what he thinks or uh, what they think is what makes them, you know, a man, you know, mm-hmm. these, these striving. And it's all, you know, all social media, all, everything. Show me the best, hide the rest. Mm-hmm. You know, let me, let me show you the car I have here, you know? Okay, well, why don't you show me the $50,000 in debt for that car that you have? Right. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I mean, the, you know, we don't put enough out there of the good, of, of just, you know, being you, being just loving life, you know? Mm-hmm. Uh, you're, you're starting to see a lot of that out there, especially on social media. You know, if you're part of certain groups that that's motivational, you know, life life is good. Mm-hmm. Hashtag type of stuff. You know, mm-hmm. you start seeing those type of things, and, and hopefully that, that keeps going because I think we're at a turning point in our in our society. I think a lot of parents like yourself and myself, you know, are, are tired with this mm-hmm. this stuff, the CRT, this, this different things are going on, the this breakdown of the family uh, this breakdown saying okay well you know what administrators can take care of your kids and you can type of thing Mm -hmm. Uh, we know better type of stuff Uh, i think there's a big shift and i love seeing it the shift back to the family nucleus you know getting away from all this negative negative stereotype negativity that's going out there and, and and also you know getting away from telling kids because of the color of skin that they're bad Mm-hmm. you know and that goes both ways you know, yes goes one way but then you know in society it's like my son that i have uh, my adopted son he's a black child mm-hmm. he's a black adult now right mm-hmm. you know um that's me you know that's i don't look at him as a color at mm-hmm. all and i i taught him not to do that in the very beginning he was all about that it's like there's no color here like no, uh, there is no color here. Yet he's changed his, his mentality with that. Mm-hmm. You know, he changed how, and I, I, you know, I taught him how to, hey, you need to, why are you dressing like that? Well, that's my culture. Mm-hmm. No, it's not, you know, it's what that represents you, how you want to express yourself. So mm-hmm. if you want to be a young adult, then be a young adult. If you want to, if you want to look like a hoodlum, then you know it's, it comes with the territory, right? You know, that's just don't fall within those stereotypes because mm-hmm. he thought that he had to do that because he was a black male, he had to dress this way, he had to do certain things. Hmm. And I was telling him, like, who's telling you this? And it'll, he learned a lot from the schools and he learned a lot of that when he was in the system, mm-hmm. so it was it had to break him from that. And uh. And that's what we gotta do. I think this is gonna be a good turning point. I mean, yeah, I think a lot of parents are standing up. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I think the uh, social media uh, definitely needs to keep changing. And also, I think in in our culture, you know, we need to highlight more of the the people out there, the fathers out there, that are are doing good and vices. Some of these, uh, you know, celebrities out there that are you know, putting up terrible videos, mm-hmm. you know, some, some, some of the terrible videos that they put up for some of the music. I mean, degrading females and uplifting certain lifestyles. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, and, and I'm right with you. The females are addressed the way they're addressed now. I mean, I, you know, I kind of feel like my own gra- my old grandpa and everything. Right? <laughs> you know, like, you know, they're dressed like, you know, but it, it, it's definitely true. As you get old, you kind of start seeing these things. It's like, uh-huh. why, why are you doing this to yourself? You're so much more mm-hmm. than, than what you need to strive for in, on Instagram. Right. But yeah, but I think, think it's going to be a turning point. I truly believe. No, I, I truly believe too. And once again, Anthony, thank you so much for coming on here, brother. It's that time. And uh, thank you for sharing with us all that valuable information. Yeah. Um, it was truly amazing and I'm super honored to have you on here, brother. And I, I know it's going to help a tremendous amount of people, dude, for reals. David, thank you. Thank you so much for having me and, uh, you know, God bless to you and everyone that's, uh, hearing us today.
Absolutely, brother. Well, take care. And uh, this concludes another episode for the show up, dad, man. Hope you guys enjoy it. Thank you.